I hope that with these new scientific principles in mind, you make the most of your back training in the new year and beyond. The findings of current scientific literature. One area that researchers have studied is how- At Athlete Next Year, we like to put the science back in strength. <sighs> What's going on, guys? Welcome back. We're gonna be doing a lecture on why scientific training is highly overrated and in fact, it's lame. So in that intro, I hope you got an idea of what I'm trying to achieve today, which is to liberate you, okay? True enjoyers of fitness and exercise, just trying to learn how to get bigger and stronger effectively over time. I want you guys to free yourself from the mindset that says science is the king of acquiring knowledge, especially regarding exercise training. A lot of it comes down to common sense and experience and your intuition, and I want you guys to rely more on that and other people's experience than quote-unquote science-based training and study, 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 study. And it's not that I don't think exercise science has something to offer us or that it can't confirm good ideas or practices that we can't really give a, a full explanation to on a detailed level basis and that that's somehow not helpful even if it does. Of course, there's a time and a place for science. So I'm not some tinfoil hat wearing guru trying to sell you crystals or anything like that, but either way, there are a lot of people who are using the term science to sell you overrated products, overhyped products, dishonest products. They use terms like science-based training to make it sound like their program is vastly superior, vastly different from what anyone else can provide you when in fact, more than often, it's not. So we're gonna break down why the perspective of thinking everything's gotta be science-based or it can't be true or it can't be good. We're gonna break down that perspective. We're gonna talk about the various issues of referring to things as scientific or looking up to people and treating them like they're experts or gods or authorities on these subjects. And we're gonna talk about how good science, in fact, comes down to common sense principles and practices that have existed for eons, right? Like decades, decades we're talking, guys. Why basically good science just reinforces practices that already exist. And we're gonna talk about the various problems in scenarios where a quote unquote expert is actually referring to a study and trying to represent the findings. Why more often than not, that isn't very helpful and sets you up more or less for confusion or failure. Let's get right into it, folks. Okay, so scientific training, it's, it's like a mindset and the word science gets thrown around. It's a total buzzword. It's almost a gimmick at this point. It's cliche. It's been overused to death, whether that's Jeremy Ethier. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to do just that with the use of a few dumbbells and a little bit of science. Or Jeff Nippert or Jeff Cavalier, athleanx.com. King of, let's put the science back in training. You have, Dr. Joel Seidman, you have Menno Henselmans. You also have Vishren, for crying out loud, trying to claim that he's science-based or that his programs are scientific or that some of the fat-burning pills and other uh, snake, total snake oil products are scientific. They're really not. No more scientific than a lot of the garbage that ends up on the Dr. Oz show, all right? But you have all these different influencers out there. Some of them, I would say, are more reliable, more credible than others. But either way, we need to unpack that because these guys do not deserve to be up on a pedestal. They are not authorities over knowledge. And I'm going to show you guys why. Okay, so if we've seen this everywhere. It's a cliche now. What does it even mean? Well, to say you're science-based training, to me, that's a misnomer. Total misuse of that term. It's so nonspecific. I mean, what amount of your methodology has to come from a study's conclusions or a study's methods uh, before you, you no longer say it's, you, before you say it's science-based or not science-based? Does 75% of your methodology have to come from studies and papers and research? Does, does 50%, 100%? Because are you really going to try and argue with me? that all of your exercise selection in a program you make, a science-based program, you're gonna argue that all of those exercises, all of the techniques, all of the tempos, all of the intensity ranges, rep ranges, all of the frequencies, the splits, you're telling me that all of that's inspired by science? I sincerely doubt it, it's impossible, okay? There's not enough, there's not enough information out there and there's too much contradictory information where people just, bicker back and forth, right? And we'll get into it later, talk about why these contradictions come. Often 
uh, from differing methodologies where they fail to control for certain variables. And that's why you have two studies that overtly contradict each other. But either way, what does it mean to be science-based anyways? You read a couple papers and now you've decided that glute thrusts are superior to squats for, for butt development, really, or vice versa, okay? You know, at, at what point is it just an exercise program? And at what point is it a science-based exercise program? Hard to say, isn't it? Now, that's, that's, that's the terminology, right? With that, saying the word science, it, it, it almost carries authority. It sounds academic. It sounds fancy, right? It makes you sound intelligent if you say, well, I've done lots of research and my programs are found, founded on science and the principles of science and the findings of studies. <laughs> Guess what? The etymology of the word science goes back to knowledge, right? So science is a pursuit of knowledge, but there's more than one way to pursue that knowledge, okay? You can pursue the truth, right? You can pursue that without necessarily skimming through PubMed papers that aren't necessarily well done to begin with. Okay, so there's more than one way to get to that information. So why give science an authority to begin with? Isn't it about skepticism at the end of the day? Furthermore, real science is based on the scientific method. Okay, good science is observable, it's testable, it's repeatable or falsifiable. Anything you claim or produce that doesn't fall into those categories isn't science. All right. And science is not contingent upon a consensus. That should make sense. It's not up to us as people collectively to decide what's true. Something is either true or it isn't. If there are a hundred men in a room and one of them disagrees with the other 99, that one man could be right and the other 99 could be wrong or it could be the other way around. Consensus does not guarantee that what you're saying is true, let alone wise. Science is a great marketing tool for various snake oil, whether that's selling types of creatine or fat burning pills, maybe terchesterone or, uh, or other similar products, right? There's so many different varieties of snake oil that people try and claim are based on science and they'll quote papers. But that doesn't mean they do a good job quoting papers, we'll talk about that more later, or that the papers are very good papers to begin with. If it's a bad paper, that's a problem. If they misquote a good paper, that's a problem. So just because something has references to papers does not guarantee that what the person's saying is truthful or the practice that they are subscribing to and recommending is a wise practice or that there are better alternatives. People use science to shut up arguments and debates. You've probably all been there, right? You're in the comment section on a video. Uh, maybe you like the video, maybe you don't. And you, you leave a comment sharing your opinion. Maybe it's agreeing with, with the video creator. Maybe it's disagreeing. And then someone gets on your case saying, oh, you can't train like that. That's unscientific. Or, oh, well, I do like this because I find that's more based on what the research is saying. Nah, 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 nah. And it's rarely this like friendly, uh, sort of atmosphere where they're trying to educate you, right? Being honest and helpful. No, it's it's more just like a, it's an argument where people are are trying to shut each other up. It's like, oh well, I've got more studies, bro. Yeah, okay, where's your source, bro? It's not a healthy mindset. It's super toxic to just throw those terms around just to shut people up. Okay, if you if you know something that's correct or better, just correct people lovingly, right? You don't have to be a jerk about it, even if the thing you practice makes more sense than what they do. Okay, we're allowed to have preferences and different opinions. You're gonna get things wrong in your fitness journey. But if you're gonna correct people later on, I don't know, at least be polite about it and civilized. Come on, man. So yeah, we've we've been there before. I remember this one guy was arguing with me in the comments on an Instagram post where I was talking about how helpful it was to increase a person's protein for the purpose of weight loss, such to the degree that Compared to someone who's just trying to get strong and put on muscle, yes, you want lots of protein for that, but you'll want even more for weight loss. And the guy was like, no, that's totally backwards, man. You need to look at the research. You don't know what you're talking about. Of course, he didn't refer to a study. He didn't, he didn't send me a link to read anything. He was basically just bashing me, calling me stupid. And he thought he was like really tough and smart, I guess. I don't know. I, I didn't take it too personally. Although I think after I replied to him a couple times, he blocked me, which is really funny. But that's what people do. Right? Despite the fact that what I was saying, not that I was going to 
you know, quote some studies, but I know for a fact there are studies that demonstrate having a lot of protein is really helpful for weight loss. And as far as common sense practices go, it's normal to ramp up someone's protein to help them lose weight, even compared relative compared to someone who's just trying to get strong, right? It's beneficial. And that's a topic on its own, so I won't go into depth, but it turns out not only was he wrong, he was being a jerk. So don't be a jerk and fact check yourself. What else? So not only people use it to shut up arguments to begin with, but a lot of these people are basically like fanboys, right? They subscribe to a certain mentality. Maybe it's a certain way of training like CrossFit or uh, doing circuit training or whatever it is, or uh, high intensity training, whatever their thing that they're obsessed with is, they're going to fanboy over it. And this might also not just be related to training method, but influencer, Jeff Cavalier, right? We all know what happened with the, the, the fake weight incident. Or Jeff Cavalier obviously was using fake weights for various lifts, most notably a deadlift. And people like nut hugged and defended him like there's no tomorrow. And there was like camps of people where either they said it doesn't matter or oh, he only did it a few times. And basically they, they each came to the same conclusion. You guys are wrong for pointing it out. Jeff's more successful than you. He's got a better physique than you. He's got more degrees than you. So shut up. That's wrong, man. If you're a fanboy of someone or a particular practice or exercise, you need to ask yourself tough questions and you need to ask them tough questions. Sometimes your training or the, you know, the, the, the people you refer to for knowledge, you can expand on this, right? You can learn more if you have an open mind, not a narrow mind. Okay. So don't be a fanboy. Fanboyism is a cancer to the mind. In addition to that, the average person or expert air quotes, is probably pretty close to what we could say is scientifically illiterate. They don't really know how to read studies or they don't honestly read studies. And that's a problem when you're handsome, articulate, charismatic, and you're making videos or, or writing articles or posts on Instagram about what a study says and how this should influence training. Guess what? If you don't do a good job of that, because you're not really a, a sciencey person, you don't have a background in research or you haven't practiced doing reading a lot of studies, you're gonna do a poor job of it, okay? So if you're not good at reading studies, if you don't have a background in research, maybe don't be in a hurry to constantly refer to research, okay? And throw it in there once in a while, but try and, try and say things that make sense, not just, oh, well, the study showed this, so it must be right. Okay, if you're gonna to point to a study, be able to explain it. You got it? All right. Anti-science is a stupid insult. If you're like me and you try and rely more on experience than let's say science, you've probably been called anti-science or a science denier. This, this term is becoming more popular in our society for a variety of reasons. Some cultural, some political, plenty related to fitness, but either way, just because someone questions what studies say or what quote unquote formally educated people sometimes have to say, doesn't mean that you're universally opposed to knowledge or formal research where you have your hypothesis, you have your methodologies, you test it out, you look at the results, you ask some questions, okay? The basics of the scientific method. I don't have a problem with any of that. I have a problem with people doing it dishonestly or doing a bad job. And unfortunately, those are very common. So calling someone anti-science is a really stupid insult. And even if someone is unintelligent, like low IQ or just not educated on the topic of science, and they really despise science. So maybe this is a fitting term for them. Guess what? The, the, the gracious thing to do is to just explain to this person simplest way you can, most helpful way you can, in order to better them. So that way they better other people. Okay, don't just bash them, right? And try and like, like treat them like a heretic. Okay, if someone is in this camp, be loving and kind to them and show them the way. Show them the way with your results, prove it. But don't just be a jerk and call people anti-science. So I hate that term. Stop using it. It's stupid. Furthermore, scientists are DLs. That's right. A lot of people who are involved in research don't look like they lift and they're not very strong, not very big, right? Not very experienced. So you have research being conducted on exercise by people who don't really exercise. That's a bit of a problem, don't you think? I'm not saying that Ronnie Coleman is, is fit to be the professor of exercise physiology, but 
they might benefit from referring to guys who have a lot of experience training, powerlifting coaches, Olympic lifting coaches, bodybuilders, people who've been doing this for a while, strongmen, okay, with regards to, you know, teaching formal classes, right? There's so much textbook stuff and not enough picking things up and putting them down and working with clients and making programs. And I, I've been through the system, guys. I've been through the formal education process. And I'll tell you what, I learned more on my own sometimes reading articles, a lot of times watching YouTube videos and eventually getting to people who are more reputable, right? After, you know, starting with Athlean X and Six Pack Shortcuts, now I'm watching Bald Omni Man, Alexander Bromley, uh, Sam Sheathar, things like that, natural hypertrophy. I, I went from the worst of the worst almost to like the best of the best. It took time to get there, siphon my way through that. And those guys didn't exist in the beginning of YouTube fitness, but there's so many great free resources who make videos. And they're not necessarily people with master's degrees and PhDs like Dr. Joel Seidman, <laughs> who, by the way, going back to shutting up arguments, Joel Seidman even just links people to a study instead of like explaining to them why an exercise is helpful on his Instagram and YouTube. It's hilarious. You guys should check out his stuff. It's really funny. Uh, but either way, so, and that, that doesn't include everyone. I mean, some guys are like Eric Helms, really jacked and involved in research, and that's great. But that's not true of all the researchers. In fact, I'd say he's in the minority based on his physique and how strong he is. He takes exercise very serious. So I think he has a better perspective when he goes into time, when it's time to go into research and look at other research, right? He, he, he's a little bit more reputable based on his experience. And your experience, in my opinion, is worth a heck of a lot more than some fancy schmancy data. Data, at best, represents reality, okay? You, are a living person, you pay attention to reality. Here's one of the logical fallacies of this whole science-based stuff. It asserts that if you're not quote unquote science-based or constantly reading papers every day or every week or referring to it every time you make a video, that somehow you're just gonna stumble into all these plateaus and mistakes and you won't get out of it because you won't be enlightened by the science. You'll just be in darkness forever. But guess what? If you make mistakes in your training, you're gonna have to think your way through it like any person with a brain and eventually you'll develop better practices. That's not to say you should be completely in the dark with regards to science, but just because uh, if a person's not constantly reading studies every hour of the day, that somehow they're uneducated and aren't gonna make good decisions, I call BS on that. That is definitely not the case. And guess what? You might not have a lot of experience. You can learn from others who have more than you and you're gonna learn so much, okay? So experience vastly more useful than just data alone. Not, not that it doesn't have any value, but that data alone has little value compared to experience. Okay, so good science. It's basically just common sense, right? The, the idea of splits for a while, people would argue about bro splits being good or, or uh, not being good, full body being the best. And what really good recent research in the last couple of years has shown is you can do basically whatever split you want when you control for volume at a similar level of exertion, you know, 10 sets is 10 sets of a given exercise, squat, bench, whatever. You can divide it up three days, four days, five days, two days, one day. It really doesn't make that much of a difference. And so maybe your subjective experience, preferences, schedule should be bigger factors in determining how you train as in a split rather than, oh, this split stimulates muscle protein synthesis more often, therefore it's better. Yeah, it stimulates it more often because you're training more often. Duh, that doesn't mean that the work being done is more or that the response to the work being done is elevated somehow magically. Okay, people want to get more out of less. <laughs> you can't really cheat work though. Yes, there's such a thing as movement economy, but you really can't cheat work, guys. You're going to have to put in the work. There's no magic split, no magic exercise. You're going to have to train. You're going to have to train hard, consistent, and for a long time to get the results that you probably want. Okay. So that's just a good example, right? If it went in a circle, bro splits, bro splits, very popular. Then people are talking about full bodies and push pull legs and whatever. And now we're back to actually, it's perfectly fine to do bro splits. <laughs> it went full circle. It told us what we already knew. Another good example of uh, I don't know, good science, right? Is talking about volume just in general. Now let's get to this here. So contradictions, right? This is what I was pointing to earlier can come from different methodologies. So let's say a study concludes 20 to 40 sets per week is, is optimal 
or uh, 30 to 40 sets per week is optimal per each exercise. And another study says 10 to 20. Well, let's just think. Those are almost double, right? What could possibly be accounting for the difference? Is it just in one study you had genetic freaks and then you had ordinary people? Or that the scientists were really smart in one study and they made they set up the, the design really well and the other scientists did it all wrong and they, whatever, human error? Or perhaps a set is not always a set. So what could be different? Well, sure, rep ranges, exercises used, range of motion technique. Yeah, definitely, that could be different. But then there's proximity to failure. So if you're only halfway to failure, you would expect to train twice as long as someone who's training all the way to failure. In order to get the same results, you have to do twice as many sets. So there you go. 10 sets per week is pretty adequate if your proximity to failure is high. Maybe 30 sets per week is necessary, unfortunately, if you're barely training halfway to failure. And yeah, sometimes people don't push themselves. And sometimes people in studies are inexperienced. And the time frames of studies aren't always very long, and that is a problem. So really, the key findings of a study are fairly intuitive. You just need to sit down, break them down, think your way through the problems logically, and you'll be able to make sense of what's in front of you. It takes a lot of research just to say a little bit about training. It probably took many, many studies on volume before people were confident saying, yeah, you know what? Just do enough volume that you can recover from, but you also get results. Gee, you don't say I shouldn't work myself into the ground until all my tendons hurt. And at the same time, I shouldn't do such little work that I'm not getting results. Wow, what a brilliant concept maximal recoverable volume and minimum effective volume. I like those terms, I like the concept, but it's kind of just common sense, isn't it? So skepticism is key. Good science reinforces past practices and research. And again, those contradictions can come from different methodologies. Now let's look at what happens when experts quote studies. Ooh, this is fun. So I, I like to think of it as a branching tree where either, let's go binary choice, accurately convey the findings or the expert misrepresents the findings. And we could argue why they wouldn't do that or would do that. Maybe it's for uh, greed, right? They just wanna make some money so they're gonna lie about it. Or maybe it's incompetence or a mistake. But either way, often people misrepresent studies and even when they do accurately convey it, there's problems. Let's look at the bad side first. If they misrepresent the findings, it could be in addition to that problem, that the actual results of the study that they are, are quoting contradict what the expert is saying to begin with. That is often the case, and that sucks. Then it could be the case that the findings are almost completely irrelevant or just, just useless. So it's kind of like a, gee, you don't say study, where it makes no meaningful difference on how you train. The knowledge does not translate to decisions and practices. Then on the other the flip side of the coin, it could be the case that even if the expert is accu accurately reporting the findings, it is still not meaningful or relevant because again, just because they accurately uh, tell you the findings doesn't mean it's gonna influence how you train, right? A good example was this uh, study that Minnow Henselmans was, was writing about on Instagram and has an article about talking about uh, protein not ramping up thermic effect of food, but they control for calories and they, they have like a normal meal, basically where the person's eating carbs, fat, and protein. Gee, it's almost as if, <laughs> it's almost as if by combining it with more food, the effect is diminished because the total thermic effect of the foods that you ate were influenced by the individual macros, meaning that your total uh, thermic effect of food would have been higher if it was entirely or the vast majority protein. Anyone who's had meat sweats before or ate protein very late before bed, you can attest to the fact that protein does have a higher thermic effect of food than something like carbs. It's obvious. It's been backed up by research in the past. And so this study, even though what he said was technically correct and, and the study was technically not wrong, I don't think it was a bad study by any means. When you really think through what it's saying, it's not going to change how people eat and it shouldn't at all. So it's irrelevant. Then on the other side, 
Yes, there are situations where an expert quotes a study accurately and is very helpful. A good example of this would be a, a study that was done where it showed basically people in their 60s and 70s and I think 50s too, they still make really good muscle gains even compared to people in their 20s and 30s. And, and the key takeaway from that is, look, if you're, if you're older, you don't have an excuse not to exercise. You might have more concerns. Maybe you've accumulated injuries throughout your life. But guess what? You can still make really amazing gains. And maybe that's common sense to think, well, exercise is good at all ages. You have the ability to move, you might as well exercise. If you have the ability to move, you have the ability to exercise. So even though it was really helpful, it, it basically just reinforced common sense, right? Use it or lose it kind of mindset. But either way. So that's all I've got for you guys. I just want you to think, you know what? Just because someone is quoting from research doesn't mean they did a good job or that the research was meaningful or if it was that you need to throw away how you train. So if you have a way that tr of training that is currently working or a way of eating for weight loss or, or, or putting on muscle and those practices are currently working, please do not be in a hurry to change them, okay? And, and refer to people who have experience more often than you refer to people who just have a list of credentials and degrees, okay? So really, think your way through problems. Don't overthink it and don't get caught up in the scientific buzz. That's all I've got for you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next one.